Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. Hey, how many of you have um, how many of you have ever been to Washington D.C. and seen the Washington Monument? You ever seen the Washington Monument? Uh, the Washington Monument it stands. It's right in front of the Capitol Building, and it's on the. Uh, where you see, you can see the, the, the water that's before it, and you can see the Lincoln Memorial, and you always see the, the reflection of the Washington Monument. You can pass those out, ushers. Go ahead and pass them out. It's 555 feet, 5 and 1 8 inches tall. And from the lobby of the, of the um, Washington Monument to the top of the Washington Monument is 50 stories. 50 stories high. Now, there's two ways to get to the top. There's the easy way, which is going in there, and you get in the elevator, and you press the button that says 50, and you go, whoop, all the way up to the top, 50 stories. Or, you can climb the stairs, which is the harder way to the top. Can you say amen? How many of you would be a stair climber this morning? Yeah, some of you would be. How many of you be, be, definitely be the elevator takers? Yep. I, I don't know how many of you know who Zig Ziglar is. Zig Ziglar is a, is a great speaker. He, he actually sold pots and pans. And uh, Miss Mavis' husband, Ted, sold pots and pans with Zig Ziglar. So, isn't that cool? In fact, he beat Zig, right? He beat out Zig selling pots and pans. But Zig Ziglar tells a story about going to the Washington Monument. And he said when he was approaching the Washington Monument, there was a, um, a line waiting to go up in the Washington Monument a mile long. He said to get in that line, you had to wait forever. And there was a guide that was standing right at the door at the Washington Monument. So he walked up to hear what the guide would say. And they said that in the line that was coming out of the bottom of the Washington Monument, this line was a two-hour wait to go to the top of the Washington Monument. And the guide said, but there's no one waiting to go to the top if you want to take the stairs. That if you want to take the stairs up, you could go right then. If you wanted to choose the harder way, then you could go right then. If you went to Wall Street this morning and you asked the question, what is the, what is the secret of greatness? I think you would find that a lot of the, the guys, that work, guys and girls that work at Wall Street would say money and a whole lot of it. And if you went to Washington, D.C. and act, ask all of the senators and congressmen and the president, what is the secret to greatness there? They would say political clout. And if you would go to Hollywood and you were to ask, how, what's, the, what's the best way to get to the top? What is the secret of greatness in Hollywood, California, I think that everyone there would say fame, being famous. Jesus had a different idea of how to get to the top. He had a different way, and he said this in Matthew 20 and verse 26. Now, I'm working on from when we had baptism. Remember when we had baptism a few weeks ago? And then last week I spoke on commitment. And what I'm trying to do is draw a thread from baptism up through your commitment to the Lord and now into service. Because when Jesus was baptized, when he came into the water and John the Baptist baptized him, that was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. That's the first that we really hear about what Jesus did and the miracles that he performed was when he was baptized and when the Holy Spirit came upon him. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And after he was baptized and after that was when he really began his ministry to the Lord. And so for all of you that were baptismal candidates a few weeks ago and all of you that last week kind of recommitted your life to the Lord, I want to go into the, what we, I feel like is the next step. And that's servanthood. That's servanthood. That's working your way to the top in the kingdom of the Lord by being the least. But Jesus was asked. 
what does it take to be great in your kingdom? And he said this, whosoever wants to become great must be a servant to others. If you want to be great in the kingdom of the Lord, you're to be a servant. You see, success and greatness in the kingdom of the Lord is different than what it is here on planet earth. In the kingdom of God, there ain't no easy elevator to the top. There's not an easy way. To get to the top of what God wants us to do, Greg, we've got to take the stairs of service and work our way to the top in servanthood. Now, Jesus said it again in, in Mark, the 10th chapter, in the 45th verse. He said, for even I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve others. And Jesus said, and to give my life as a ransom for many. So even the Son of God himself said, I didn't come to sit around and be served. I came to be a servant. They were talking this morning. I, 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 was, I had a good, good Morning America on. And they were talking about uh, Meghan Markle. And how different that her life would be after marrying one of the prince of England. How that when she woke up this morning, that somebody was going to walk into her room or walk into where she was and say, What could I get for you, Duchess? Her name had been changed because she had married a prince. Servants were at her beck and call. She'll never have to do anything else for herself. Servanthood. You see, the secret to greatness in the kingdom of God is not how many servants that you have. But it's what kind of servant that you are. It's not trying to build yourself up to a place where you've got people working for you. And having all the different people doing things for you. But it's what kind of servant that you are. There's a story in John chapter 13. Most of you know this story. If, if, if you would open your Bibles now, you would know what it is. And Jesus approached the disciples in the upper room where they were going to have the last supper. And he came in with a towel around his waist and a bowl of water. And Peter said, what's going on? And Jesus said, it's time for us to wash feet. And Peter said, I'm not washing feet, not even yours. And Jesus said, I know, I'm going to wash yours. Servanthood. And I want to ask you the key question for today. Are you more interested in being served in a church? Or are you more interested in being a servant in the church? Are you more interested in being served in the church? Or are you more interested in being a servant in the church? I know, Greg, you've been in service a long time. Mom, Dad, Vivian, you've been in ch church for a long time. Most of the time, when people are disgruntled with church, there's two things they say. The church isn't giving me what I need, and I'm not being fed. That's the two things. Well, if you're saying that about what we do here, I just want to say this. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> because... If you're not being fed, it's because you're not coming to the table. It's your choice to be fed. If, if your mama calls you at dinner time to time to eat, and you don't come and sit down at her table, and you stay in your room, and you become anorexic, it's not because mama didn't have food for you. It's because you made a choice not to come and eat at the table. Are you more interested in being served? The church is just not meeting all of my needs. I don't know about you, but my Bible says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Not my, my God, comma, at the church. A first grade teacher asked her kids the question, what do you do to help at the house? One kid came and said, I dry the dishes. Another kid said, well, I feed the dog. Another kid said, well, I sweep the floor. And everybody gave an answer except for one little boy sitting at the back. And, of course, his name was little Johnny. And the teacher looked at him and said, Johnny, what do you do to help out at home? He said, teacher, I stay out of the way. <laughs> there are far too many church members that do that same thing. They just stay out of the way. A Gallup poll discovered that only 10% of church members are active in any kind of personal ministry personal ministry in their church. 
Even what's more amazing, 50% of all church members said they have no interest in serving in any ministry at the church either. We believe, we believe that every member is a minister. That if you're a member of a church and you're here at a church, that you need to be involved in some kind of ministry. That you need to be doing something. Because let me go ahead and warn you that I don't believe there's any excuse for a saint refusing to serve. There's no reason for it. I want to give you four reasons why you should determine to become the minister that God wants you to be. Now, if you've come here this morning and this is your first time in church, <laughs> you feel like, good night. <laughs> this is probably not a message that's going to make you cry, but it needs to. Because all of us have been given giftings and abilities that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And some of us are hiding them out. We're undercover brothers when it comes to ministering to other people. So number one. A sovereign God expects me to minister to other people. A sovereign God expects me to minister to other people. Now, Ephesians 12 tells us why that we talk about the five-fold ministry of the church. So we have evangelists and pastors and teachers and missionaries and all that. It says this. I've given you those for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. For the equipping of the of the saints for the work of the ministry. See, you were created for ministry. You were created for ministry. Paul says in Ephesians 2, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Say it with me. Good works. We're God's workmanship, created to do good works. Ministry and service are our reason for our existence. Everything God created has a purpose. Now think about it. In God's creation, birds were created to sing. Bees created to give honey. Cows were created to give milk. Fish were created to swim. Dogs were created to love you. Cats were created for, nah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> to aggravate dogs. There we go. I knew there was something. Cats are pretty smart, though. You'll have to give them that. I, we've never had cats at our house. Um, ever, and, but we have had three cats that came up and they are still around our house. But the good thing is, one of them rascals got a mole. <laughs> thank you, Jesus, for a cat that will kill a mole. We don't stop right now, Lord, and thank you for cats. Lord, <laughs> cats were created for what? But you were created for ministry. You and I were created for ministry. God designed you. He gave you special talents to make a difference. God want, He made you the way that you are so that you could do what He wants you to do for the kingdom. Let, let, me, let me tell you something. We have a simple mission statement at our church. We believe in what? LG? Loving God? Pretty simple. When Jesus was asked, out of all the commandments, what is the most important thing? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love one another as you love yourself. He said that's the most important thing we can do. But we exist. We exist to lead people to be different through knowing Christ and growing in Christ. And to make a difference through serving Christ and sharing Christ. There's your mission statement. We exist as a, as a body to lead people to be different through knowing Christ, growing in Christ, making a difference, serving Christ, and sharing Christ. That's why we are here. That's why we are a church. The reason that God makes you different is so that you can make a difference. That's why you and I were created, to make a difference in someone else's life. You were created for ministry. And not only that, you're called to ministry. You're created to ministry and you're called to ministry. The call to salvation and the call to service are identical calls. When Jesus first met the disciples in the Sea of Galilee, he went to them and he said, Hey guys, come and be my disciples and I will show you how to fish for people. That's what, that was the two things that Jesus did. He said, come, I'm going to show you how to act. 
I'm going to show you what to do. And then I'm going to show you how to do it for somebody else. I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you a disciple. But then I want you to go and do it yourself. You see, the call to salvation was be my disciples. The call to service was fish for people. Fish for people. And here's the cool thing, Willie, about fishing for people. When we fish for people, I mean, when God fishes for people, we get them in, he cleans them up. If we go fishing, we're going to fish, and then we're going to kill them. Because we're going to kill them trying to clean them up. Our responsibility is to fish for the people, bring them in, and let God clean them up. Amen, Viv? Ain't that it? Because when we try to clean up people, we're going to kill them. That's not our responsibility. He says, go get them, reel them in. Bring them in and let my grace that's sufficient for every need do the cleaning up. Every Christian has been called to minister. Every Christian. If you're a Christian this morning, if you're not a Christian this morning, then we got to back up and do some other stuff. But if you are a Christian in this house this morning, you're called to minister and you're called to a ministry. Now, that doesn't mean that every one of you are called to full-time service. That every one of you is called to work full-time in a church. That's not what what it means. That's not what it means. But it does mean that every Christian is in full-time Christian service wherever you are. Wherever you are. Listen to the scripture. In Romans 7, 4 it says, Now you belong to him in order that we might be what? In the what? Are y'all all there this morning? Can y'all read? Can you blow it up, make it larger? Some of them can't see it, Rhonda. Now you belong to him in order that we might be what? In the service of God. See, the problem with some of you reading this is you're undercover brothers. Because see, the Bible says once you know the truth, then you're responsible for the truth. And some of you don't want to hear this message because you're cool sitting back on the sidelines letting everybody do everything when God has called you to something that you haven't been doing. Right, Papa Ken? (laughs) <laughs> Tell you what he said He said be careful Every Christian is to serve the Lord Listen to me Full time We're to serve the Lord All the time There ain't no part time Remember we talked about last week Having our job slice Our family slice Our work slice Our this slice And then we got our little slice of the pie called our Jesus slice. That ain't it. It's all or nothing. Because I said this last week. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Next thing. The saving grace of the Lord enables me. He expects me to. He enables me now to minister to others. In 2 Timothy 1.9 It says this, it is God who saved us and chose us for his holy work. Now what is holy work? Holy work there refers to ministry. You'll find, find if you look in the Bible and you look in the Greek, the word ministry is the same as the word service. So a servant in the Bible was a minister and a minister in the Bible was a servant. The word minister in itself is kind of misunderstood Because we all think that a minister is only somebody who's ordained. We think of a minister. But when you do that, you really kind of misconstrue what the meaning of that word is. Because you might be surprised to learn that the word minister comes from a Latin word called servant. And the base, the root of that word is minus, which means less. So when you're talking about minister... Technically, a minister is someone of lesser rank or lesser status that simply wants to serve and not be served. You see what I mean? Because we change it around and we think of a minister as somebody that's high and mighty. But the word truly means that a minister is someone who serves, is lesser than you. You accepted the Lord. You were saved so that you can serve. You and I both, we were saved so we can serve. We were not saved so we can sit and soak and sour. So think about this. If our only reason on this earth is to go to heaven, 
if the only reason that you're saved is to go to heaven, and that's the only, the only thing that God, the only checklist that God has for you is when you accept the Lord, Jordan, that right then you're going to go to heaven. Why don't he just take you home then? Why don't you just die right then? If the only reason that you've accepted the Lord is just to not go to hell and to go to heaven, then why don't he, as soon as you come to the altar, oh, Jesus, I accept you as the Lord and Savior of my life, you're gone. The reason is that you were saved to serve. God has a ministry and something for you to do. You were placed on this earth. You accepted the Lord and you were saved into the ministry. Why does God want you in a church? Because he wants you to minister in a church. Why does God bring needy people to you during the week? Because he wants you to minister outside of the church. Not Contrary to what a lot of religious faith teaches, we do not believe that you are saved by service. We do believe that you are saved for service. Not by any good works that I should boast. But you accepted the Lord and you were put into the place as a minister of the gospel of the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And does that mean you got to stand on the street corner and preach? No. LG. Love God. And minister to people right where they are. He expects you to. He enables you to. And number three. Spiritual guides equip me to minister to others. It equips you. We'll give you the equipment that you need. i gotta, I got to tell you, this is my favorite part of this message. Because it shows what God expects of me and what God expects of you. And remember, the word minister, lesser, servant, is somebody that serves the people. It's not somebody that's greater than you. Now look at this. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Paul says this. And he gave himself to be, some, to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. That's the ministry of what the church is. Now, the next question we're going to ask is, why? Who's he himself in that verse? Jesus, the Father. He himself gave giftings and abilities to some as apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And why did Jesus call those five different categories? For the equipping of the saints... For the work of ministry, for the edify, edifying of the body of Christ. You see what I'm saying? The reason I was called to pastor is to help equip you, not be an ogre over you, but to show you how to do it. How do you do it? How do you do this? How do you minister to other people? This is a description for what the pastors are and the evangelists are and the apostles and for the people. You see, if you'll notice, the saints in that is us. For the equipping of all of us, for the work of the ministry, and for edifying the body of Christ. I'm not here... To do the ministry of the church, I'm here to give my ministry to the church. There's a big difference. Because, see, the ministry of the church doesn't belong to the pastor. It belongs to us, the people. That's where the ministry is. You getting that? He's placed me in a place to help equip you and prepare you for what's going to come on Monday morning. But I can't go minister where you are. It leads me to the second thing. My, my, my number one job is to equip you to do the work of ministry. That is the primary job of the staff that works with me and under me is to prepare all of you for the work of ministry. You see, some people have the idea that the pastor serves the church by doing everything. Listen, if my staff, if, if we do everything, we are not serving you. We're crippling you as a body. We're crippling you as a body. Because we will not only be doing what you're supposed to be doing, then we will be neglecting what we're supposed to be doing in equipping you. 
Somebody said this, that the first Reformation put the Word of God back into the hands of the people. And I believe that we need a second Reformation that will place the work of God back into the hands of the people. Here's the key. When the pastor leads the sheep and feeds the sheep, and the sheep follow the pastor and minister to one another, everybody is happy. Because that's the way that God intended for the church to operate. When he feeds the sheep, and the sheep follow and minister to one another, then everybody's going to be happy because that's the order that God has placed for us. He's placed me in a place to equip you, to help you, to push you, to mentor you, to disciple you. Jesus said, come, be my what? Disciples, now go and fish. Number four, spiritual gifts empower me to minister to others. I'm almost finished. What are the four things so far? Expects, enables, equips, now empowers. Say those four with me. Number one, expects, enables, equips, and empowers. All right? Not only has God given you equippers to help you for the ministry, but he's given you the equipment to do the ministry. He's given you the giftings and the abilities to do the work of the ministry. I had a lady this morning. She's one of our greeters, and she's work, been working as one of our greeters out front for the last couple weeks. And I went to her this morning, and this is what she said. I said, I am so glad to see you here handing out these handing out the bulletins and smiling she said pastor I can't sing I can't do anything on the stage but I can smile I can smile your wife's got a pretty smile too ain't she bud God has given us the equipment now look at this in Romans 12 6 I'm almost done God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well now look if there's one word in that, in that verse that I absolutely love. God has given us the ability, which is cool. But the next thing, to do what? Certain things, which ain't everything. There's some that come, and they just want to do this. All right, we have their hand in that a little bit. Oops, I'm going to be over here and do this. And they do that. God has not equipped you for that. He's given you gifts and abilities and talents to do certain things well. If you can't sing, there is no reason for you to be in the choir. If you can sing, there ain't no reason for you not to be in the choir. If you don't like children, you should not be in the nursery. Can anybody say amen? amen? If you don't like teenagers, you should not work with the youth. If you're allergic to grass, you shouldn't mow the yard. But there are giftings and abilities that you have. There's some of you that are great teachers that have never ever volunteered to help in our children's church program or with our kids. Because you feel, well, I work with kids all week long at school. I get paid to do that. I don't want to do that at church. But God's given you a special gift to work with those children. Some of you could do bulletin boards and have great artwork. You could do anything with your hands. Some of you have great computer skills that will be wonderful with us upstairs. Some of you could run a camera. How many of you have a phone? Not a quick, quick, quick question. Then you have a camera. And if you have a camera, we could teach you how to run a camera in this room. But you have to be willing to do the certain things that you already know how to do. I'm not asking you to do something out of your comfort zone. I'm asking you to do something that you are good at. That will we'll, we'll see you flourish. Something that I'm not good at. Every Christian is gifted. We're not all gifted the same way. But we're all equally gifted. In the sense that God has given all of us abilities and gifts that we need to use to build the body of Christ. Well, I can't do nothing. Well, you just talked. You can invite somebody to church. <laughs> right, James? Here's the cool thing. Whatever gift and, gift and ability that you have, 
God hasn't wasted it on you. He hasn't wasted his time making you just like you are. You see, every gift, now look at this, every gift and every natural ability that you've been given, that God gave to you, you, you need to be using it as a ministry. Don't say you can't do anything because you can. God has equipped you. God has given you a DNA that he's not given me. 1 Peter 4.10, look at this verse. Each of you, how many is each? All of us. Each of you has received a what? To use to do what? Serve others. A gift to serve others. Oh, pastor, I can't do anything. Can you bring in groceries at your house? Then you'd be perfect to go down and help Vivian, Vivian at Bomb of Gilead. Because there's people down there every week that they carry groceries to their car and sit in the back of their car and say, Lord bless you. We all walk in and out of the grocery store, so we all can volunteer to help her carry groceries. Can you fold up a shirt? I ain't talking about ironing, amen? <laughs> How many of you believe an iron is from the devil? Say, can you say amen? <laughs> I can't iron worth a flip. I can't. Gil Wise. I don't know how many of you know Gil Wise. Gil Wise is now the superintendent in the Methodist Church of the Eastern Coast Division from like Raleigh all the way to the Outer Banks. And he is over, I don't know how many Methodist churches. And Gil has flourished. He's been a church planner. He's done a great job. And he used to be on our staff years ago. Gil is one of the smartest guys. I graduated from high school with, with Gil. One of the smartest guys in our senior class. He went to Methodist University, graduated from Methodist University, went to Duke University, and went up there to the School of Divinity. And when he got up there to the School of Divinity, he had to wear a shirt and tie every day. First week of college, he went up there. His mama wasn't with him to iron his shirt, so he ironed his own shirt. And he checked to see how hot the iron was and stuck it to his face. And came home with that little angly thing and the little dots all the way down. Duke University graduate, Gil Wise. Way to go, Gil. Proof, irons are from the devil. <laughs> Spiritual gifts have been given to you not for your enjoyment, but for his employment. Spiritual gifts have been given to you not for your enjoyment, but for his employment. You have been produced for a reason. How many of you like Christmas? I love Christmas. But if I'm going to buy a gift for you, Janine, and I'm going to go spend a bunch of money on that gift, and I never give you that gift, and I never see you open that gift, then no matter how much money I've spent on that gift, and it's still stuck in the box, it's worthless to you. But when that gift has been given to you, and you open that gift, and you begin to use that gift, then me as the giver are absolutely thrilled with what I've given you that you can use and you can wear, and it's exactly for you, and it fits you perfect. That's the same way that God has given you gifts and abilities. He's given you these gifts that you've let set with the lid on them, and those gifts are worthless unless you open them up and begin to use them for His kingdom. I'm determined, and I'm determined, Greg, for our staff to help our kids and help our teenagers and to help our, our young adults and our older adults to discover your gift and to help, help you develop your gift. And then not only that, Viv, but deploy the gifts that you've been given. There, I, I think there's two real reasons that church members get frustrated and irritated and even lose interest in church sometimes. I think it's either because you've never discovered your, your spiritual gift and you don't know what it is. Or you have discovered it. And either they're not using it or they're just not using it in the right place. And you're frustrated because you've had these gifts and abilities but you're just not using them. Or you're using them in the wrong place. You need to make sure that whatever, whatever you're going to do for the kingdom, that two things. Number one, that you have the ability and the giftedness for it. And number two, that you've got a passion for it. Because if you don't have the ability and the giftedness to work on a computer upstairs, then you're going to be frustrated in what you're doing. 
But if you use what you've been given, then you flourish in your gift. And you're happy where you are. You have to go and do what you're good at. I had a guy come to me a couple weeks ago in church. I was right at the end of church. And he asked me, he said, Pastor, do you think it's a sin to play golf on Sunday? I said, man, I ain't sure, but I've seen you play golf, and I think it's a sin any day of the week for you. I, I'm not sure. Amen, Frank. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to close by asking you to take a couple things with you. First thing is, this church needs you. We need you for ministry. We need to impact the kingdom of the Lord. If not, we just need to shut down. We just need to close the doors. Because if we're not equipping you and giving you an opportunity to go and to serve, we just need to shut the doors and go to another place that they are equipping the saints. You ever thought about this? Did you know that that not just one human being made this pencil? Think about it now. In order for this pencil to become a pencil, somebody had to mine the graphite. And somebody else had to process the wood. And somebody else had to go in the jungle and find the rubber. And then produce the rubber to make it into a way that it was an eraser. And then somebody else had to manufacture the paint and to come up with the font and the artwork that's on the pencil. Somebody else had to work a lay at one point or another or engineer the metal that holds the pencil, the, the pencil and the eraser together. And then somebody else had to sit down and take the graphite and the wood and the paint and the artwork and the metal and the rubber and all the different things and put all the parts together to make a pencil. And then not only that, it took somebody else to say, hey, you know what? These are perfect for tests. When only a number two pencil will work. <laughs> Remember that? You get in trouble if you didn't have a number two. You can come in there with your little clicky one. Nope. Can't use that one. Got to use a. But then somebody else had to market it. Distribute it. Somebody else had to package it. Someone else had to drive the truck. To bring it to Walmart. Keep thinking now. Somebody else had to open up the boxes and put them on the shelves. Had to display them on the shelves. So that when I walk in as a consumer, there's a young lady there. And I say, excuse me, I got a test to take. Could you tell me where the number two pencils are? They're on aisle, aisle 17. Not in Walmart. Where are they at? They're back in the, where? 23? Hey, where are the frozen pizzas? I need some of them too. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. It's the same thing in what we do. There's not one person that can do all them things that it takes to build a pencil. There's not one person that can do everything it takes to build the kingdom and to make the kingdom work like it's supposed to work same thing true with this crazy pencil it's true with every one of us one thought I want you to carry home this morning you need to ask God if you haven't already to give you the attitude of a servant it's against our nature because the average person looks for a church to ask the question how can this church meet my needs But when you step to the next level of greatness and you work that next step to the top of what God has called us to, 
you begin to say, how can I be used in this church to meet the needs of others? Whose needs can I met? And here's the thing. When you begin to worry about the needs of others, God will take care of your needs. Because it puts him as not it puts him as a call to his word. We're so obsessed with living as long as we can so that we do everything from watching our diet and exercising to take it and vitamins. Well, if you don't get anything else this morning, it's not doesn't matter how long you live. What matters is how you live. It's not the duration of your life that matters. It's the donation of your life that counts. It's not the duration how long you live. It's what have you given for the kingdom. You know the one thing that God is looking for this morning in our church? Servants. Servants. Because see, if you go back to the very first verse we read, that in the kingdom of God, the only way to greatness is to serve. There's a famous conductor, some of you may know who he is, his name is Leonard Bernstein. He was the, the symphony director and conductor of the New York Symphony. And they asked him one time, they said, Dr. Bernstein, what is the most difficult position in the orchestra to play? And without hesitation, he said, second fiddle. The person interviewing him said, why is that? Is playing second fiddle violin so much tougher than playing the piccolo or the bassoon? He said, no, it's not tougher. It's just that everybody wants to be first chair violin. You got to learn how to be a servant. How to serve. How to step up to the plate and say, you know what? There's a need here, and I need to meet that need. There's something that I can do for the kingdom. Or you come to me, or you come to Pastor Vivian, or, or to Pastor Ken, or, pa or Pastor Lillian. You say, what can I do to help? And I'll look at you and say, what can you do? What do you do? I don't know, I can't do much. I'm strong, I can all tables you know what you'd be perfect to come in here on a Thursday afternoon help us move the tables out and mop the floors when the kids are done at the end of school hey I could do that I could come on my way home from work and help you perfect come by oh you know what we got a Wednesday night dinner coming up too we'd love to have you come was it, remember Jose you guys remember Jose Jose was here for many many years Jose was from Philippines. In the Philippines, Jose was a dentist. But when he moved from the Philippines to the United States, his dental credentials wouldn't come with it. So he came to the States with a doctorate in dentistry and could never practice dentistry anymore unless he went back to school and started from scratch all over. But we would see Jose here every Wednesday night. Jose would be the one. In fact, when they lived in the Philippines, he and his wife lived at such a level because he was a doctor, they had servants in their home. Jose would come on Wednesday nights when we had our Wednesday night dinners. And he would be under the ruling of the Gestapo, my mother. <laughs> Amen, Lynn. Every kid at Riverside Christian Academy is scared to death of my mama. Just let me tell you all that. She's coming. <laughs> Think I'm kidding. Ain't it the truth, Lynn? But Jose came and he said, Miss Lillian, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to plate. But I know how to mop. Jose would come in on Wednesday night and said, before you could finish your last bite, can I say amen, Mr. Sammy? Before you would finish your last bite of eating, Jose would have your plate in the trash. You're like, whoa! And then he would stay there and clean up everything in the room. Because he wanted to do it. And mom taught him how to minister unto the Lord. 
And Mr. Sammy, you couldn't take that away from him either. He loved it, didn't he? He was faithful to it. You think, man, that, that's mopping the floor. That's doing it as a servant, as unto the Lord. That's taking whatever gifting and ability. Was he gifted to do more than that? Absolutely. But he said, you know what? I can't do this. I can't do this. But I can clean. The Lord is calling us all to a greater calling than we ever could imagine. And it's a calling of servanthood. It's a calling of servanthood to each other. Loving God. Loving each other. Making music. Sing that with me. It's loving God, loving each other, music with my thank you for today and I thank you for your word that's gone forth. Lord, I know that this has not been a cry, get out your handkerchief kind of message. But Lord, I hope it's been a challenging message to our people because Father, I believe that this is a message that can take us to the next level of what we are as a church. Lord, when we equip the saints for ministry and everybody finds out how that we are fitly joined together, it will make a difference in the kingdom. And Father, that's why we are here is to build your kingdom. So I ask you, Lord, that from the oldest person to the youngest person, from the most successful person to the person that needs a job, Father, I ask you that all of us can examine ourselves and say, I can be used by you. Father, I ask you that as a pastor and as a staff, that you would give us the giftings and the abilities, that you would help us, Lord, to equip the saints for ministry even this day. So, Father, I just ask you that as we continue to grow and as we continue to move and we continue to have our being in you, that you would continue to teach us, Lord, of what it means to be a servant in your kingdom. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everything that you have done. But, Lord, I am more excited about what you're going to do in this place and in this kingdom. In the name of Jesus, and we all said, amen. Give me one second. There's some folks that asked me if we would open up the doors of the church to join our church this morning. So if there's any of you that would like to come this morning and be a part of our church, and I know some of you wanted to come and do that, but you're thinking now, well, if I come get a member, I'm going to have to work. Yes! I, I should have joined last week. He's going to give me a job. If there's any of you that would like to come and join the church this morning, we want to give you that opportunity. We'll wait just a moment. Come on, my brother. Yes. Hey, Teresa. That's Teresa. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we need to teach you, James. Then just fill them out. Praise the Lord. Come on. Vivian, come and meet all these people and shake their hand for me. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says, and it added to the church what? Daily. Yes. Yes. Come on.
respond to that, Chuck. Tell the one of her fish is here. Yes. Y'all look. Love this. Thank you, Lord. 16 brand new people coming to the church. Thank you, Lord. Y'all stop writing just for a second. I want to ask you two things. If you have not accepted the Lord as the Lord and Savior of your life, these are the two prerequisites that we have. That you accept the Lord and you be baptized. So if you've not been baptized, we'll set up a time for you to be baptized and we'll let you know when that is. We won't, we'll baptize probably in the next uh, 30, well, we'll see how many we get. We had 30 last time. We'll see what we got. But if you've not been baptized, if you've not accepted the Lord, we will lead you to the Lord and we will baptize you. And we will put you in a place of ministry that you can be used. Amen? Amen. Hey, I would love for you to do this. They're kind of wadded up down here, but I would love for you to come and, and shake their hand. Welcome them to the church. Introduce yourself. I want you to find somebody that's in this group up here. Introduce yourself to them. Find out what their name is. So, and find out where they're sitting at so that next Sunday you can be looking for them. And then you go back to them and go, hey, I'm Wesley. Good to see you, Patrick. Because this is just like, come here. It's just like Cheers. They want to go somewhere where everybody knows their name. Which that's a bar. That's a horrible analogy. That's why I picked Patrick. No, but isn't that true? You want it? Milton, play it. That's it. <laughs> no, but you want to go somewhere where somebody knows your name, right, Toya? So I want you to come introduce yourself to these people and welcome them at Fable Community Church and find out what their name is. Lord, love you. See you soon. You can go home.